All right. Well, welcome, everybody. So glad to have you here at our next Tree University presentation. We have been doing these every month since March, so not a very long time. Um, but we've been having a really great time getting together this way. We can all come together from different parts of the world and keep learning about um, all things trees and other horticultural topics. My name's Julia Wilson, and I'm the program coordinator here at Chadwick Arboretum. Behind me, you've got the labyrinth, so I like to set the stage as if we were in person. Um, and in the picture on the screen, we have our beautiful hosta garden. So please do, if you are in the Columbus area, come out and visit us. We're really a, a beautiful 62-acre um, garden. We have been having a very busy month here at Chadwick um, with things starting to open up again. Finally, we were able to um, get our spring plant sale fundraiser happening, which is really just wonderful. Last year we did have to cancel, but it's really our, our pinnacle event of the year uh, where we um, not only raise funds for Chadwick Arboretum, it's very important for our operating funds, but student groups also um, here at Ohio State University raise money as well. We had it much toned down to what we usually have, but for the smaller um, event that we were able to plan, it was really um, a fantastic success. And for all of you who are here tonight who came and supported that, thank you so much. We were also so lucky to have Marsha Armstrong, an environmental art, um, artist here in Columbus, Ohio, do an art installation the very same weekend called Willow Archipelago. It was beautiful. And if you didn't get to see it, she does have a website up so you can see some of the photos. Coming up after um, this talk next month, we've been doing the fourth Thursday of the month, this time of the day, six o'clock p.m. Um, and we are really excited to be welcoming our interim program director, who you probably have met at other webinars. She's going to be speaking on shrubs for the home landscape. So, um, and I have to say, she is a wonderful presenter. You won't want to miss so go ahead and sign up um, even tonight while you're here. But without any further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to Megan Lovejoy, who is our host tonight. She will also be running the Q&A here after our um, presentation with Bill, and she's going to introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Julia. Welcome, everybody. It's an honor for me to introduce Bill Johnson for tonight's Tree University. He'll be talking with us about how to grow great fruit. He's a firm believer in keeping an open mind in the garden and that there's always an opportunity to learn more and hopes you will do the same. He's a well-seasoned veteran of growing fruit trees and shrubs. He's given numerous talks about grafting, pruning, growing fruits and vegetables. He's spoken in front of large groups at the Franklin Park Conservatory, the Organic Gardening Club of Central Ohio, and has done new member training for the Franklin County Master Gardeners and like so many other events. But I don't know about you, but I'm excited to learn how to properly prune my apple and pear trees because they've gotten a bit unruly over the years. So without further introduction, let's welcome our speaker for the evening, Bill Johnson, who's zooming in all the way from Northern Ireland. Take it away, Bill. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> can anyone hear me? Megan, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, and let me see if I can advance. Julia doesn't look like uh, the screens are advancing. Oh, there we go. We do have it now. Uh, as mentioned, I'm in Northern Ireland right now. I've got a daughter that recently moved here from England and uh, she they moved to three and a half acres uh, and they need to have a, a 
They want fruit trees. They want uh, all sorts of fruits. They want vegetables. They want raised beds. They want compost piles. And uh, my wife and I are going to have a very busy month uh, working on uh, on the property over here. Uh, and out the north window, we saw cows. And out the south window, we saw sheep on, on adjoining farms. So it's a really a lovely uh, area. But I want to, uh, I've gone to the second screen. If you want to get the most out of growing fruit and growing it well, there is a publication called the Midwest Home Fruit Production Guide that was written by a lot of the staff at Ohio State, including Dr. Gary Gao, and that also uh, uh, professionals from other universities. It is a Bible that you should have. It answers so many questions. It costs $26 to buy, and you can get it from the extension office, but it is so worthwhile. Matter of fact, I brought this, my copy, to my daughter and son-in-law, because while they do not live in, uh, in the Midwest, 90% of all the information in there applies well. It talks about how to plant, what varieties to choose, and, and some of the questions were about varieties. And so for example, uh, 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 persimmon, somebody asked the question, uh, do you need both a male and female? And the answer is, unless you have mender, M-E-A-D-E-R, which is a self-pollinating variety. If, if you have that, you do not need a male and female, but all other uh, North American persimmons you do need to have. And I found that information by just going to the right page in the book. Otherwise, I would have not had an answer for you. So, so again, Midwest Home Produ Fruit Production Guide is something you, you really need if you're serious about, or even if you're casually interested in growing fruit. Uh, okay, come on screen. Uh, sources for plants and also resources available. Uh, you know, if possible, I say buy local if you can and go to full service nurseries. I don't want to say bad things about the big box stores, but uh, uh, you're much better off to go to the, the ones that you probably know and love already. In Franklin County, you know, the Oakland Parks, the Straters, the Dills, they know, know uh, fruit, they know how to take care of it. So you get a, get a plant that is uh, well cared for and it's gonna uh, survive and thrive as, uh, as you plant it. Uh, there's some excellent mail order operations too. I personally love Stark Brothers. They're out of uh, uh, an hour north of, uh, of St. Louis in Louisiana, Missouri. It's a river, Mississippi River town and just a great, uh, great organization. Uh, they recently bought Miller Nursery, uh, Adams County Nursery. Many of you know Adams County is in Southern Ohio and this is not that one. Pennsylvania also has an Adams County. And especially I know uh, some of the extension agents that do grafting programs, they will buy their rootstock and scions from Adams County Nursery out of Pennsylvania. And when it comes to berries, uh, Indiana berries are a good source. And one of the things I look for when I, if I do need to buy things through catalogs, I try to go ahead and find a, uh, a nursery that's in a similar climate to Columbus, Ohio, or possibly a little bit colder. Uh, uh, don't want to say bad things about Georgia, but buying a uh, buying a nursery stock from a southern nursery, it may be great stock, but is it really acclimated very well for the uh, for the central Ohio area? And for that person out of, uh, I think it was Ontario, you probably have some great places up there. And I maybe even would consider Ontario because if it grows there, it will probably grow in Columbus. Uh, when it comes to resources. OSU Extension Office is a great, uh, great resource. OSU website has a lot of information. And, but there's also Dr. Google. And my one suggestion, if you are going to be doing uh, Google searches, add in your search .edu. You will get more research-based hits than, than uh, if you don't include the .edu. 
And I really do encourage you to go ahead and do that. I know when I see a, a, a tree catalog and if it talks about all the glowing things about a silver maple, I probably won't buy anything from that company because they're, they're trying to sell things, not give you uh, good information. And uh, I know raspberries was one of the things that was very high in the uh, things uh, people were interested in. Uh, we have a tremendous resource here in Ohio, Dr. Richard Funt. Uh, Dick is actually a friend of mine. Uh, he was the OSU Extension Fruit Specialist for the state of Ohio. And just, uh, he has a publication on raspberries and he's, he's uh, got an international reputation. So if you wanna grow raspberries, that would be one. It's a, it's a publication that I own myself. Uh, here's a big challenge and it is a huge challenge. Finding the best plants offering disease resistance, pest resistance, meeting your pollination needs, meeting your site requirements, sun, moisture, soil, pH, et cetera, frost concerns, hardiness for cold, while giving you the taste and production you want over the growing season. All you need to do is find all those things and you're gonna have fruit that has a pretty good chance that's gonna thrive for you. Now, you probably aren't gonna necessarily find all those things in one particular variety, but those are some of the things you wanna think about. If you have a high pH soil, do not grow blueberries in the ground. It's, you're gonna be fighting a losing battle. If, if they do survive, they are not gonna be thriving. So these, those are things that you should uh, hopefully take into consideration. Uh, when it comes to fruit trees, and I was telling Julia that normally I do not lead with fruit trees in this presentation because I think you can have a lot more success in growing other fruits than trees. Uh, one of the problems we have with growing uh, fruit trees in central Ohio is we don't have the right climate. Uh, I heard uh, a uh, well-known orchard grower uh, in Northeast Franklin County, uh, Mitch, uh, speaking that apples originate in the Ural Mountains in Russia, which is a semi-arid area. And when you think of where a lot of apple production is in the United States, it's in Oregon and Washington. Again, those parts of, it's not on the coast, it's in the semi-arid part because lower soil, uh, lower, lower, lower humidity. So that alleviates a lot of the, uh, the fungus and disease issues. And, uh, and also, uh, of, um, so, so we have uh, things against uh, going against us right now because of just our climate. Uh, when you are looking at fruit trees though, uh, one of the things you wanna decide is what size tree do you want? We have dwarf trees, typically growing eight, 10 feet tall, semi-dwarf, which will grow uh, 12 to 20, depending on growing conditions. And we have the old standard trees that would grow 20 feet and sometimes much, much taller than that. But you don't see a lot of them being grown because where I grew up in Northeastern Ohio, we had uh, an old orchard that was close by. And we had trees that were three feet in diameter and 50 feet tall. And they, they produce fruit because standard trees will produce fruit a lot longer than dwarf and semi-dwarf. Only problem is, unless you had a 35 foot ladder, you weren't able to pick anything. So that's the reason why we don't see many standards unless it's in a very old planting. Now, dwarf uh, and semi-dwarf, how do you get them? Let me go to this uh, one. You use what's called grafting or the nursery or the plant grower use what's called grafting. And if you go ahead and take, and this happens to be a, a sweet cherry, and if you take a look just a couple inches below the, uh, the soil, and this is, I have it in a pot right now, but that is what's called a graft union. What they've done is they've taken a root stock and cut it off, but then they, they grafted a sweet cherry scion that was compatible with that root stock and it healed over. I wish I could point to the screen to, to point these things out, but you'll see there's, there's a bulge a couple inches above the soil. That's where that graft union is. The graft of, of uh, connecting the rootstock with, the, uh, with the, uh, the variety that you want to grow. Um, everything above that, that bulge 
is that new cherry tree. Uh, everything below it is the rootstock. And oftentimes that rootstock is not necessarily a desirable fruit. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, it may not even be a, a, a bear fruit, uh, but it has other characteristics. And that takes me back to the screen before. There's what's called the mauling series of rootstock. And it's not only for grafting apples, but, but other varieties too. So you maybe have seen M9 and M106 and M112. That stands for, the, the M stands for mauling. And if you read up in the top part, there is a research station in East Mauling, England, which is about 40 miles sort of Southeast of, uh, of, uh, of London. And I'd love to get there sometime to, uh, to actually see. But back in the uh, 1912, uh, Ronald Hatton and colleagues, they went ahead and took a look at, at the various rootstocks available uh, across Europe. And they, they decided, they did experiments to find, okay, what ones, what size we're gonna get, but it's more than just the size of the fruit. It's also what growing conditions does that rootstock do well in? So does it grow well in sand? Does it grow well in wet soil? Uh, does it grow well, it does it have winter hardiness? And uh, one of the ones that's most commonly used in, uh, in America is M9. So that was the ninth rootstock that they had analyzed. So it has a designation of M9, Molly 9. And that is for dwarf uh, fruit trees. Uh, like all things in life, not everything is great all the time. It's, it's a wonderful rootstock, heavily used for, for dwarfing trees, but it's, it's uh, one that it, it, the stability of it is not. So a lot of times they recommend that those may be uh, uh, staked, although I don't have any of mine staked in uh, more than a year after I planted my trees. Uh, and it also is maybe not as quite uh, winter hardy. So you folks up in Ontario, that may not be, uh, M9 may not be one you want. Uh, but so that's, do a little researching on mauling and uh, rootstock. And uh, I think it's just fascinating uh, reading. So, but let's, let's move on here. Uh, Julie, I may need your help. <laughs> oh, there we go. I got it now. Okay, so let's start out with apples. Uh, one of the things about apples, they need cross-pollination. Uh, and the good news is uh, most apple trees will pollinate other as long as they're blooming at about the, the same time. Uh, uh, but two that are, that are noted for being good pollinators for other varieties are the Golden Delicious and the Enterprise. So those are something that I would look for and if you're gonna have, because you need to have multiple varieties to go and get pollination. Now, maybe you're lucky and you have a neighbor that has an apple tree, or maybe there's crab trees that may provide that cross-pollination. Uh, also, and when I plant up my trees back 37 years ago, I wasn't thinking about disease resistance. Most people weren't even thinking about it, but there are three that are noted for being good disease, disease resistance. Doesn't mean they're disease free, but they're more resistant than a lot of the others. Enterprise is one, Gold Rush, and Liberty. And Liberty is sort of like a Macintosh type apple. Now, if you notice, Enterprise is a great pollinator and is also disease resistant. So, so I'd recommend uh, if you're gonna have a few apple trees, maybe Enterprise is a good, uh, good one to have as part of that mix of uh, varieties that you have. Uh, as far as varieties, there's tons of them. The Midwest Fruit Production Guide lists uh, dozens. Uh, but Wolf River, Suncrisp, and Crimson Crisp are, are a couple that typically get pretty high ratings. Um, but you know, it's it's fun growing. Uh, uh, Brayburn is fun growing Gala because those are great apples. My personal favorite is Melrose. Uh, it's uh, it's not a pretty apple sort of a russet type skin, but it has a great crunch and to me a great flavor. And it's also sort of a, if, if Ohio had a apple, well, the Northern growers in Ohio would vote for Melrose because it was developed in Northern Ohio. Uh, but the Southern Ohio growers, they wanted to be Rome because that was developed in Southern Ohio. 
Uh, and uh, I put in here, apples can also be used for espalier. That's where in, instead of having the nice round uh, tree, you can have a very narrow one, either along the side of a building or uh, uh, fencing. And espalier is sort of probably not the thing you want to start out with, but that's something for after you've been growing trees for a while. Give it a try. It's a, it's a good experiment and it, it tests your skills and finding the right variety is, uh, is helpful to, for espalier. I'd mentioned about standard, and this is at my son-in-law's farm over in McConnellsville, which is in Easter, Ohio. This is one of four apple trees that his grandfather planted, and I have no idea when, but all of you probably carry a six inch ruler in your billfold. And if you see in the uh, tree on the right, that's, a, that's my six inch ruler that I always carry. It happens to be a dollar bill. If you want, it can be a $20 bill. They're all about six inches, but you'll see the diameter of that trunk is, is probably a 18 to 24 inches there with the uh, limbs. And uh, it, it, it does wanna grow tall. And when I started helping my uh, uh, son-in-law on it, my gosh, uh, uh, those trees were 35 feet tall and produced a fair amount of apples, but unfortunately you, uh, you couldn't get to most of them. So I've been working for five years now trying to go ahead and get it, uh, get them shortened down. And I've been, been pretty successful. So that's an example of a standard tree. My trees, again, 37 years old. Gosh, most of them are, are maybe eight inch diameter, maybe 12 inches, but nothing like these uh, standard trees. Uh, let's move on to uh, cherries. There's two primary types of cherries in, uh, in Ohio. You have sour cherries. But you know, with marketing, you know, times change. They are now referred to as pie cherries. Uh, and the good news on pie cherries is uh, they are self-pollinating. And Mount Morrissey is probably the one that is best known and, and most grown in, uh, in Ohio. Uh, sweet cherries, those are the Bing cherries, the uh, Mount Rainier, uh, wonderful cherries, uh, great sweetness. Unfortunately, it's really, really hard to grow them, especially in central Ohio. And the reason is they require a excellent drainage. And if you don't have excellent drainage, they will, will do okay for a couple of years and then they, then they start declining. Uh, the, most of the sour cherries uh, that are grown are grown up in Michigan. And other than just being that state up north, Michigan is one giant sandbar. So they have excellent drainage and that's the root, one of the reasons why cherries grow so well in, uh, in the state of American, uh, uh, Michigan. I, I, I would really recommend that you do not try uh, sweet cherries unless you're able to go ahead and provide for excellent drainage, which means probably mounding and, and a lot of sand and things. And it's, it's probably not worth the, uh, the effort, especially when you can grow sour cherries with, uh, with conditions that we have. Uh, here's a picture of me in front of my uh, 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 cherry tree in bloom. Now you'll, you'll notice over my other shoulder that doesn't have blooms, that's a graph that I'd put on uh, a number of years ago. And that one actually blooms uh, a couple weeks earlier than the Mount Morrissey. So I, I, I'm able to go ahead and by, by having two different varieties, in this case on one tree, I'm able to extend the picking time because the, the other one, which I, if I remember right, I think it's a Stella, uh, will bear fruit earlier than the Mount Morrissey. Uh, and here's, uh, here's some of the cherry on the Mount Morrissey. And I want you to take a close look. You see the cherries there and there's that brown stuff hanging down. Oh my gosh, what is that? And uh, I, I don't expect any of you to do it unless you take a look at the tree in the background and that is a pin oak tree. And that is actually the flowers that have fallen off the pin oak tree and they're just you know five, six inches long. Uh, uh, they had been a, a light green, now they're brown. So it's not a disease, it's just uh, things falling off of my uh, oak tree. So don't be concerned. It, doesn't cause any problems. Moving on to pears, uh, beware, pears are subject to fire bright, uh, blight. Now I have not had that on mine, so I've been fortunate. Uh, pears, I think are a, uh, 
if you want to grow tree fruit, I think pears are pretty good. Probably three or four years out of five, I do not have any insect or disease issues. And probably one year or two years out of five, I will have some gnarly uh, pears. And part of the issue is I, I don't spray. I, I've, if, you, if you want to grow fruit that looks like it came from the grocery store, uh, because of our growing conditions, the humidity and, and uh, disease pressures and insect pressures, uh, it's very hard to do it in uh, central Ohio, but you can maybe get away with a couple things, uh, pears being one. Uh, cherries, I think one of the reasons why you, I can get away with growing cherries without spraying is they fruit pretty early. You're able to pick fairly early. So they haven't had months and months and months for these issues to, uh, to, to cause damage to the fruit. Uh, but on the pears, uh, uh, Chap's favorite is a good variety. Sickle is offers some disease resistance. Uh, they're also good as an espalier tree. And uh, 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 the, I have one pear tree. Uh, they do need cross pollination, although there is one variety, I think it's called uh, Honeymoon or uh, something like that, that is self pollinating. But I have 13 varieties of pears on my, uh, on my pear tree because I've done grafting over, uh, over the years. Uh, and here's a, uh, a picture of uh, some of the pears that are on my tree now. And the reason why I'm showing this, I've mentioned on the prior slide that it can be used for espalier. Uh, pears typically will have a very vertical orientation where you'll have a number of limbs going straight up, which is not, not great from a fruit production standpoint, but, but they also are what's called uh, having spurs. And I, I think I mentioned that a little bit earlier where spurs, instead of the fruit growing along the the horizontal limbs, they grow off of spurs that are sort of sticking up from the limb. And gosh, I've got too many spurs. Uh, but spur fruit uh, can be helpful if you're growing espalier fruit. But enough said about that. Uh, moving on to peaches, because peaches was one in the poll that people had a lot of interest in peaches. And boy, a great peach tastes wonderful. Uh, and peaches are self-pollinating, so you only need one tree to go ahead and be able to get a crop off of them. Uh, but there's a lot of issues with, uh, with peaches. Uh, one is they, they have a tendency to bloom fairly early and they're very soft or frost uh, uh, sensitive. So you can, uh, you can wind up losing your entire peach crop. And this happens not only to home growers, but the uh, of, of the big growers, there's uh, gosh, uh, you know, one in Licking County that's Brands, uh, Branskull, uh, not remember the name exactly, but there's some years where they'll have no peaches. Uh, uh, and also the trees are sensitive to freeze damage and you can actually lose peach trees at you know sometimes minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And while we haven't had minus 15 uh, much lately, uh, it's devastating if you wind up losing a tree because of uh, frost damage. Uh, so the question I have is, can you justify growing peaches uh, with the frost issue? And the last two years I've had peach crops and I've never eaten one peach because I wound up having, uh, I'm assuming squirrels that wind up getting them. And, and like most things, the wildlife like them two or three days before us humans like them. Uh, but if you do want to grow them, and again, they're, they're great when they work out, Harkin and Reliance, according to the Midwest Fruit Production or, uh, production Guide, are two good varieties here in this part of the state. Okay, and here's a picture of my peach tree. And you'll see the top limb, uh, uh, you know, it was, what, about six peaches on. And, but then if you look at the bottom right, uh, bottom center and bottom right, you'll see a whole bunch of peaches on that limb. The difference between those is on the top limb, I went ahead and picked off. I did what's called thinning to go and reduce the number of, uh, of peaches. Uh, and on the bottom, I haven't gotten around to doing that yet. And I wanted to be able to show the picture that uh, self thinning is, the tree will do some self uh, 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 thinning on its own. Uh, 
There are also chemicals you can use that will go ahead and cause uh, thinning to occur, but I find it easier just to go ahead and do uh, uh, thinning, not only for peaches, but I'll also do it with apples. And when I do it, I'll let them grow for a while. And then what I'll do is if I see any uh, fruit that has any damage on it, boy, that's, that's a good one to go ahead and pluck off. Uh, if I see ones that are, that are way smaller than the others, I'll go ahead and pluck those off. And really I should take more of these peaches off. Uh, some people say a hand width apart for most of your fruit will give you better size. And, uh, and especially with peaches, uh, one of the problems you have is if you have a bumper crop, you can very easily have a lot of limbs break just because of the sheer weight of all this fruit. So if you thin the fruit, you're gonna get larger fruit and also less prone to being uh, damaged because of limbs breaking. So something to consider if you're growing, uh, growing peaches. Uh, plums, uh, uh, I've got one plum three, tree with three varieties on it. They do need cross pollination. So again, I'm an advocate of using grafting. If you don't have the space to do a, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, have a lot of trees. So I'm in, in, as I mentioned, pear, I've got 13 varieties, plums, I've got three varieties. I've got apple trees with uh, half a dozen varieties on it. Uh, plums are subject to early frost, but that really has not been a problem on in my property. I live about uh, five, six miles sort of north, northwest of OSU campus. Some varieties, the Midwest Fruit Production Guide recommend if you want an early plum, uh, Bradshaw is a good one. Mid is the Italian prune. Stanley is an old classic uh, plum and bluestone. Uh, with pears in particular, or excuse me, plums in particular, you gotta be aware of something called black knot. Uh, black knot is a fungal disease. It will start on a, on a limb and it will grow. And uh, it, it, after a while, a year or two, it can actually girdle the limb because of this uh, black knot that grows on it. I know one person who refers to it as a as poop on a stick. <laughs> uh, and it sort of looks like about the diameter of a hot dog uh, that's surrounding the, uh, the limb. So it's really important, especially if you have any signs of, uh, well, it's important anytime to sterilize tools between, uh, between especially trees. Uh, but, uh, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's especially important if you have any signs of black knot to, uh, uh, to sterilize it. I think there's just a chat message uh, of Sue. I, I didn't catch it. It was honey something that is the self-pollinating uh, 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 pear tree. So thanks for putting that up and you can probably see it in the chat list. Uh, 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 fruits, if you want success, and you want success quicker. Because again, those dwarf trees, that's probably four years before you're gonna, three, four years before you're gonna get any uh, apples. Uh, the uh, uh, semi-dwarf is probably five or six and standard trees, so this can take seven to 10 before you will see fruit uh, set. Brambles, you can plant in the spring and you can be picking in the, uh, in the fall. Uh, red raspberries, I think, are a great choice. And that's one of the things my son-in-law here in uh, Northern Ireland desperately wants to grow. He wants to make homemade wine like, like his, his father-in-law does. So we're looking forward to him having red raspberries. Uh, and they're, they're, I don't have much of a disease issue. They are subject to, uh, if you have wet soil, you can, after a number of years, you can start running into problems. But uh, a prelude is a wonderful uh, early raspberry uh, in, in mid-August Caroline uh, and early summer and uh, mid-August is prelude Caroline in the autumn. Uh, they're pretty easy to, to take care of. You just need to go ahead and remember to prune out the old flora canes and those are the second year old canes. They, they reproduce well, uh, sending up suckers from the roots. Uh, black raspberries are also a, a great choice. Uh, uh, they have, a, the red raspberries do not have uh, 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 thorns on them at all. Uh, the black raspberries, they have very tiny ones, but they're not gonna be, be uh, causing you any, uh, any damage. Uh, it's the old traditional blackberries 
that grow up along railroad tracks and grow in the woods, those are the ones that, boy, if you reach in and are not careful, you can come out with bloody arms. But good news, the what is being grown primarily now is thornless blackberries, and Triple Crown is a great example. But there is absolutely no thorns uh, on, uh, on thornless uh, blackberries. Uh, you got to be a little careful, though, because the thornless varieties are more sensitive to freeze damage. <clears throat> and uh, according to Dick Fund, you know, you can, uh, at a minus one degree Fahrenheit, you can have a 10% loss because the, of, of the, uh, the berry production. And you can have a 90% loss at nine degrees, uh, minus nine degrees Fahrenheit. So you got to be a little careful on that. The good news, though, is uh, even if they, even if it gets to be 20 below, the crowns, which is down in the soil, the canes may all die above the soil, but that next spring there'll be new, uh, uh, there'll be new uh, stems coming up or new canes coming up. Now you aren't going to get any berries on that first year growth, but but at least you don't have to replant the uh, the entire plant. Uh, so uh, so. The, Brambles, if you want production, you want it quick, you want to have relatively little disease and insect issues, uh, that's in my mind a way to go. Some people may have some uh, bird damage, uh, but you know you can use netting on that. You know, if it's, a, it's a lot harder to, uh, to, to do it if you're, you know, Dick Fun, he would have 300 foot long rows. <laughs> Uh, it's a little bit tougher doing that, but if you just have a backyard uh, uh, berry patch, not a problem with uh, with netting. If if uh, birds even become an issue, and again, I've in 37 years, I've never had any issues with the uh, birds getting uh, getting the berries. A couple other ones, strawberries, a classic one to grow, uh, pretty easy. Uh, uh, you want to go ahead and and never plant strawberries too deep. You want that crown above the soil level. And I actually will go ahead and do mounds, my rows mounded up to give them better drainage. And again, make sure the crown is above. So you wanna get the roots in, but you don't wanna get the crown in the soil. Some varieties that are, are, are good or early girl for, or early glow for early berry. I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's next one. I read it out of the Midwest Root Production Guide, uh, but it's supposed to be June and great taste. All Star has some disease resistance. What I actually grow is TriStar. It's an everberry, which means that you get a, a, a crop in uh, June and then you get another crop, crop in, the, uh, in the early fall. So uh, uh, the total poundage on an everberry is gonna be less than a, uh, a, a, a June berry, but I'm after it to, uh, to go ahead and have the grandkids be able to pick strawberries uh, for a, a couple weeks in uh, June and then a, a couple weeks in the, uh, more in the fall. So uh, it's up to you. If you wanna do a lot of, uh, of um, making jams and jellies, uh, you may want to go ahead and concentrate all the production in June by doing a, a, a June bearing uh, uh, variety. Blueberries is, uh, is another one that's uh, wonderful to go ahead and be able to eat. Uh, but I do want to uh, uh, tell you that you got to be careful because pH, uh, the soil acidity, uh, uh, acidity or alkaline level is critical. And you want to have, uh, you know, 5.2 on, uh, or even lower. You know, four. Some places will say a pH of four or five is necessary, which means it's a very acidic soil. Which means in Central Ohio, we don't have much of that soil. Uh, uh, so one of the things is consider growing them in pots, and that's what uh, the uh, Gary Gow, along with Ryan Slaughter, down at the OSU Piketon uh, Research Station in Southern Ohio. They're doing a project where they're growing uh, blueberries in pots uh, and, and also bags. And that way they're able to go ahead and control the pH a lot easier uh, on, uh, uh, in that as opposed to putting them in the soil. Uh, if you do raise them in soil, you wanna be uh, 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 careful also with the water that you're using. 
there's a, uh, for those of you that go down 23, there is a large berry, uh, blueberry operation uh, along the west side of Route 23, just north of South Bloomfield, that had what I would consider very bad looking bushes. Uh, they had worked on improving the soil level or the soil pH, but what they didn't take into consideration is the water that they're using the water was a very alkaline water. And, uh, and therefore they wound up having a lot of uh, uh, issues with, uh, with blueberries being too, uh, uh, too alkaline. Uh, Blue Ray is a good early, Blue Crop is a good midsummer, Liberty is a good late. My personal experience is I grew four varieties. I only have one that survived and it was Herbert. And I think it was more forgiving than the other three varieties on pH. Um, uh, if you want to go ahead and improve soil on, uh, uh, to make it more alkaline, elemental sulfur is, a, uh, is probably one you want to use. It takes a while. You'll have to continue putting it on. Uh, so give that a try if you really want blueberries. And one of the nice things on blueberry, raise them in pots. It can be an ornamental. You can have it out in the front. One person had a question about, hey, I've got a small yard. You can go ahead and have the blueberries in a, in, in a, in places that are not garden type, uh, type areas. Uh, moving on, here's a picture on the left. That's my uh, Herbert that's growing in soil and it's survived for 20 some years, but it's not thrived. And uh, the picture on the right is, uh, is a blueberry uh, bush growing in a pot where I've been able to control the soil pH uh, much better. And um, I'll probably get much more production on that than, uh, than the ones in the soil. Uh, Want to talk about some other fruits and uh, gosh, I wish I had, had you all for three or four hours, but I don't. So I'm gonna cover some of these uh, quickly. Uh, uh, this is rhubarb, and that's me. No, it's not chest high. I'm actually sitting on my bottom, but uh, I wanted to be able to go ahead and show you. And but you'll see the uh, the size, of the leaf, and the size of the uh, of the stock. Uh, I I like growing rhubarb. It's uh, great. I could I've got a, a recipe for Mrs. Porter's world famous rhubarb punch, which is a great uh, punch to drink. Uh, very, uh, I never had any disease issues, never had any pest issues. Uh, they, they, they grow well. And it can also be considered an ornamental if you uh, need to uh, camouflage it in maybe some of the front yard areas. Uh, uh, next one, this is the, uh, uh, you can still see some blooms and you can see some of the fruit uh, forming on hardy kiwi. Now this is not the size of the kiwi that you buy at the grocery store that comes from New Zealand, uh, but these are hardy kiwi and they're, they're decent size. They're, uh, 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 actually let me go back, uh, uh, they are about the size of a grape or a large grape. They have the same, to me, the same texture, the same flavor. As the uh, as the kiwis you buy at the store, they have the same fuzziness on the uh, the skin, but again they're they're much smaller. But the big thing is they grow in our environment, uh, and uh, uh, here's a uh, a picture outside our uh, bedroom window. And if you take a close look, you can uh, see the roof of our house, and you can see a little bit of the brick of the side. Uh, even though we're on an acre, we uh, we do have uh, neighbors. And it's a very vigorous grower. And I think it's a wonderful, if you're trying to go ahead and have a dual service, you want some privacy, but you also want to be able to grow some fruit. A hardy kiwi is a good choice to go. Now you got to be a little bit careful with it because you do need to have a male and female. And uh, typically they say a male can pollinate maybe four or five female plants. Uh, they are subject to frost damage. Um, and a lot of times the leaf will come out and then you'll walk outside and uh, after a cold night and the leaves are all brown, but they will go ahead and send out a new uh, flush of uh, leaves. And I think they can even sometimes do it up to three times, but uh, uh, they, they've, it, it's something that's sort of fun to do and give it a try. Uh, the, uh, this one, you're not gonna be able to pick it out from the photo, but these are goji berries. 
And uh, a goji made a lot of press uh, a few years back. Uh, it's one of those super fruits. And, uh, and so we, we raise it. It has a uh, red berry. And if you want to, uh, to have a, a puckering mouth, <laughs> you just eat a couple, go or you eat one goji berry. They are so astringent that it's, uh, 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 you, you wonder why anybody grow them. Well, they grow them because the ones you buy in the store, which are dried, uh, I think they put so much sugar on them that, uh, that they taste uh, uh, palatable. But uh, I think from a nutritional standpoint, there's supposed to be a lot of, uh, of grilled pluses on those. So give them a try. It, it's sort of a fun thing to do. There's also some black goji berries that you can also get a hold of. Uh, and one of the questions people had was about pawpaw. And this is, uh, this is what pawpaw looks like. They have very large leaves. Uh, the pawpaw fruit I think is, uh, is great. Uh, I've, uh, I, this is a, a picture that I got off the internet because I do have some pawpaw started from seed, but you gotta be a little bit careful. You know, they're, 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 they, they're a tough one to grow from the standpoint that uh, uh, number one, uh, you need multiple varieties and you need the, uh, uh, in their juvenile state. So when they're just coming up, they need shade. They're an understory tree. So you wanna go ahead and have them, uh, uh, so on the edge of a woods or some sort of shade. It, the shade can even be taking the plastic snow fence and that may provide 40% shade, which is enough. Uh, but if you want to grow them into a, into a field type environment uh, uh, or in understory, you have a, a lightly wooded area, uh, you can grow them there. But the problem is for them to bear fruit, they need sunshine. So a lot of times if you're walking through a forest and you'll, uh, and if you see, I mean, uh, it's, uh, they can, you can spot them for two ways. Number one, the large leaves. And number two, when the fruit is uh, is on the ground because they've ripened, and typically it's it's probably in September that they're going to ripen. But the issue is that uh, uh, to get them to fruit, they need sunlight. So if you're walking in a forest and you see it, if you look around, it you may see, oh, look at that big tree that fell over a year or two ago, and that opened up a canopy in the forest. So the trees that have maybe been there growing there for 10 or 15 years and never bore, a, never even had a blossom on them, uh, all of a sudden got enough sunlight so they could grow. The taste I think is great. It's sort of a, some people describe it as a custard, uh, 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 sort of a banana type flavor. And I think they're just a, a neat thing. They have very short shelf life. So best way to find them is find them in the woods or go to a, uh, to a uh, farmer's market where maybe somebody, but they're going to be a very limited time that you'll, uh, uh, you'll, you'll have them available to you. Uh, next thing is it's, you, you may figure out by look leaf, but this is a, uh, this is a fig and I, uh, I, I haven't had great success with them yet. I, I, uh, uh, some figs will, uh, uh, they're cold sensitive. So I have this actually behind a garage. It doesn't get great sunlight, but I uh, uh, don't want to lug around the pot that it's growing in. People, a lot of folks will go ahead and bundle them up with winter. They'll bend the limbs down, weight them down, put straw and tarps and stuff over them. Uh, there is a variety called Chicago is the common name that is less sensitive to uh, to freezing. And I've, I've read where you can actually grow them without providing winter protection. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, but if you're looking for some that may uh, be not a lot of work to take care of, uh, take a look at, at Chicago to see if that's the one for you. And here, if you take a close look at this picture, you know, gosh, that looks like an apple. And well, uh, leaf isn't quite an apple leaf, but sort of like an apple. This is actually a quince. And uh, I've, I've grown quince for a lot of years. I got to say that uh, they're sort of a fun thing to grow. The blooms in the spring are beautiful. 
uh, just a lovely uh, small, uh, I remember reddish, uh, maroonish type, uh, type bloom. Uh, but I don't do anything with them. Uh, I never get around to uh, to making quince jam or anything like that. It's not a type of fruit that you go ahead and just take a big bite out of, but it's sort of a fun thing to uh, to grow. So uh, give it a try if you're uh, if you're uh, if you're interested. And I think that's that's the end of my uh, my slides. Uh, how are we doing on time? Looks like. Uh, can I pass it back to uh, Julia and and, uh, and uh, any questions or things that, that people want to know about that I can tr try to offer? And again, a lot of the answers are going to come right out of this uh, this book. And again, I want you to buy it. I do not give any commission on this, but it's it's going to make you a successful fruit grower by having that resource. Hey, Bill, thank you for that. It was awesome. Can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. I can. Okay. Okay. Yes, we have lots of questions. We're very inundated with questions. So I'm going to start with the stuff that people submitted earlier and see if that kind of ticks off some of the ones that people just submitted. All right. What are some of the most important steps for successful apple trees in the first few years? Well, the big thing is read the book, <laughs> and but but uh, uh, get him started off right. Uh, getting having good, uh, good good plant stock is a key. Uh, you want to go ahead and site selection is very important. You don't want to have them in a real wet area. They do like most plants. They want full sunlight. Uh, when it comes to pruning the. Uh, Different people say different things, but normally you want to do maybe a, a if you the tree you plant has some broken limbs, cut those off. But you normally want to wait, wait a year or so to get the plant established before you do pruning. And then the uh, there's whole books and, and the guide and there's things on the internet. But you want to go ahead and have what they call scaffolding limbs. So, uh, you know, you have and you have the central leader approach and you have the open canopy. But uh, with apples, I normally do a central leader where you wanna have some limbs, maybe two, two and a half feet off the ground, maybe three going radiating off from the stem. And then up another two feet, some other ones, uh, three maybe radiating off. And then if you're doing a dwarf, maybe at, at six or seven feet uh, going off. But each level, the lowest level, the limbs going off are wider. The next ones are narrower and the ones that near the top are shorter because what you're wanting to do is to allow air movement and sunlight to get in. And uh, so if you wind up having the top limbs that are overshadowing the, the scaffolding limbs below, they aren't gonna get the sunlight needed for fruit production. And uh, they're also gonna be, uh, the foliage is going to just stay wet more and therefore you're gonna wind up having more disease. So those are some of the things as far as getting trees off to a good start is, is doing some of those uh, pruning. I really don't fertilize my uh, fruit trees. Uh, I think my soil is, is adequate enough to, uh, to, to, to do it that way. And uh, I see Sue Simon just saying, do you ever prune using an open V shape? Yeah, with prunes, actually that's a, a, an open structure. And I, I do do that, especially with, uh, with uh, plum trees. But hopefully that's good enough. Again, Yeah, that's the a lot, you're right, it's a lot. Um, okay, how do you keep pests, we're on to strawberries. How do you keep pests? i.e. chipmunks and insects from eating strawberries? Well, <laughs> that can be a challenge. The classic answer on all things in growing uh, vegetables and fruits is grow enough that when they get their share, there's still enough for you to enjoy. Uh, uh, you know, uh, luckily on my strawberries, I really don't have much of an issue. Yeah, ants and insects get some, but there's enough others. Uh, I would imagine netting is uh, is an approach. Uh, I don't think rabbits really bother them, so putting a fence around is not going to happen. Uh, it's more the birds that are going to fly in, 
and the chipmunks chipmunks can get anywhere <laughs> uh, they have a mind to. So maybe trying netting would be an approach. Again, I don't. Luckily, I don't have experience in trying to exclude uh, uh, things from my strawberries. Okay. Yeah, we have a, a couple questions about insects and diseases. Uh, next one would be. Well, what products or and when would you spray fruit trees to protect against insects and diseases? I guess. Well, you know, that's a, a challenge. Uh, you want to avoid what was it? I was still trying to spray maybe 10, 15 years ago. And in June that year, we had 26 days of rain out of the 30 days of June. Uh, you can't get an effective spray program if it's raining that much. Uh, one thing that I do is uh, in the late winter, I will use what's called dormant oil. And dormant oil is horticulture oil. It's not an oil, it's not a petroleum oil, but uh, you spray that on the, uh, the trees. You try to go ahead and get quite a bit underneath the layers of the bark. Uh, and what it does is, is uh, interferes with the insects that are overwintering underneath the bark. And hopefully you wind up uh, killing a number of those uh, insects that are gonna wind up causing damage. Uh, some other things you can do uh, from an insect standpoint is, and I, I've never been successful at this, but the experts will say, uh, rake up the leaves to go and try to minimize things uh, overwintering in the uh, leaf litter below trees. I don't have the time and effort to, uh, to go ahead and do that. Uh, of uh, be vigilant. Uh, one thing I used to do with my apples, and I probably should still do, I would use a uh, uh, occasionally pheromone, pheromone traps to go ahead and attract uh, insects. But I would also get uh, uh, think of it as like a styrofoam Christmas ornament that's painted red, and you cover it with what's called tanglefoot, which is sort of consistent of like a Vaseline. And uh, tanglefoot, it tangles the feet. And uh, insects aren't necessarily the smartest uh, thing in the food chain. And they see, boy, this is uh, April. I see that beautiful red apple. I'm gonna go over and, uh, and they wind up getting uh, stuck. Uh, I don't know how effective they are, but it makes you feel like you're at least doing something. Uh, but then the other thing is those that are, that are uh, able and willing to spray and in, in the earlier poll doesn't sound like many folks want to do that and I, I don't want to do it. The, the, the fruit growers don't want to do that. The, the big nurseries don't want to do it, but they have to because people aren't willing to go and eat the fruit that I'm personally willing to go and bite into. If I get a worm, no big deal. <laughs> But that's not, I'm, I'm not the typical consumer. But when it comes to spraying, they typically will say, you don't want to go, if it's raining, you got to spray more often. But typically every 10 to uh, 14 days, you're going to need to get, uh, get a, a spray program going to go and minimize the insect damage. So you had the dormant oil. Is the horticultural oil different than that? Uh, the dormant oil uh, is, is the, is the non-petroleum. I'm sorry, I didn't catch all what you said there. Oh, I'm sorry. What it's, so somebody was asking about horticultural oil and they were wondering if you could spray during the fruiting stage, is that different than the dormant oil? I think they're one, typically they're one and the same. A dormant oil because you're spraying them during the dormant season. Uh, and you, so you wanna do it before the uh, trees come out in bud and definitely before they uh, they uh, uh, start blooming, because it's going to enter. It's the dormant oil is not going to kill a a, a, a a honeybee, but it's going to make it a, a more of a problem for any pollination to occur. So horticultural oil, dormant oil, as far as I know, are the same thing, but you just do it during the dormant season. So I, I'll typically try to do it. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've, I hear the forecast is, hey, it's going to be 50 degrees the next two days. Uh, so I'll go ahead and put it on because maybe those insects that are, that are overwintering under the bark would maybe be a little bit more active, a little bit more respiration going on. And that will be a way to, uh, to not eliminate the insects, but be able to, to cut down on the number of insects that will be surviving during the growing season. 
Okay, I think we lost Megan. I don't see her on here anymore. So I'll take okay. up the Q&A for us. Okay. Um, and maybe just for a few more minutes, because it's already surprisingly seven o'clock. Um, and for you, Bill, it's <laughs> what, midnight? It's midnight, yes. It's midnight, so, <laughs> so I, I took a Friday. nap this afternoon, though, so uh, that helped. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, thank you again. Um, let's see here. Let me scroll and make sure I ask something different. Um, how about, since we're sort of on the topic still of herbicides and pesticides, could you talk a little bit about um, grapevines? Do they need to be sprayed? Uh, should they uh, thin them? So just some tips on growing grapes. Oh, uh, yes, some tips on growing grapes. Yes, you definitely want to go ahead and prune grapes heavily much heavier than what you'd ever think. Uh, think. And there's some good videos out there. And also the pruning on the grapes has changed over the years. I remember when it used to be, you would have a, you know, 10 buds and now they're wanting to go ahead on laterals. They want to only have uh, six buds. Uh, uh, I've never had the case where I needed to thin the fruit after the fruit had been uh, uh, blossoms and fruit starting to form. Uh, but yeah, uh, if, if when you're pruning in the, uh, in the uh, uh, late winter or early spring, and you want to do it before the, the uh, grape vines start to uh, grow, uh, you're probably going to be cutting off 75% of what grew last year. Uh, and and the, it's, this is one where the, the more you prune, probably the better you're going to be for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're gonna get better fruit. And also you're trying to go ahead and allow more sunlight getting into the vines and into those flower buds and also minimizing uh, fungal issues. And fungus is the big issue with grapes. So if you wind up having less vegetation, better air movement going through, you're gonna be able to go ahead and have less of a need for spraying. But, and again, I've never sprayed and, and occasionally I would lose uh, my grape crop, but I, also I was only growing, uh, I only grow Concord grapes and they're more forgiving than probably some of the, uh, some of the seedless varieties and some of the newer varieties. But uh, Concords are pretty, uh, pretty determined that they wanna grow. Hopefully that covered, uh, covered the question well enough. Yes, thank you. Um, how about, let's do two more questions. Are you okay with that, Bill? Absolutely. All right, we just have so many and there's just so many good questions. We're gonna have to have you back again. Um, well, and people can always get this book. Yes. <laughs> again, it's just filled with knowledge that, uh, that uh, people need to know if they wanna grow fruit. Okay, so two more questions. Go at it. Two more. Julia. All right. Um, I think you kind of answered this just a little bit, but um, they're having uh, problems with the pollination of pawpaw flowers. So maybe you can speak a little bit about how that works. Oh, yeah, that's, that's one of the other issues with growing pawpaws. Uh, I'd said before, you know, the, the juvenile shade, and the, but they need sunlight. Also, Honeybees are wonderful, but honeybees do not pollinate pawpaws. The thing that pollinates pawpaws are certain types of flies and beetles. So, uh, so they are not geared for great pollination. So that's the reason why you want to go ahead and have the trees close enough together. And, you know, sometimes even though you, you, you want to have space for air movement and so forth, Again, beetles, <laughs> so you, you wind up having to have them uh, fairly close together. Uh, and uh, um, there's the old story is back in the olden days, and maybe some people still do this, but they would, uh, to go ahead and attract the, the beetles and flies, they'd find roadkill and hang it up in the trees because that would help attract flies and that would attract uh, beetles to, that in, in essence would then help on the pollination. But if you, if you do see a, a, a pawpaw flower, it's a beautiful flower. Uh, uh, 
maybe the size of a, of a half dollar, but uh, the ones I've seen have been uh, sort of a magenta color. They're just a beautiful blossom, but they are hard to get pollinated. Uh, uh, so uh, having different varieties, you gotta have different varieties. Uh, and sometimes that can be a little bit hard, especially if you're digging up, uh, hopefully you're not digging up out of uh, woods, but it's hard to go ahead and find ones that are different varieties. So uh, if you wanna grow your own, uh, find some known trees that you know are different varieties and, and uh, collect 30 seeds and, and uh, cover them with chicken wire so the squirrels don't eat them up. I learned that the first year I tried to do uh, pawpaw seedlings is squirrels will go after the seeds even if they're in the soil. Uh, but yeah, get, get multiple varieties and try to make sure you're in a habitat where the uh, bees and beetles or the flies and beetles are, uh, are helping you out. Okay, so our last question is, um, is going to be, you know, just a little bit more bigger picture. Um, I think you'll, uh, this will be a nice fun one to end out on. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what you think about planting non-native fruit species like white mulberry? Um, do they provide functional ecological benefit? Should we be phasing these out um, for things like the pawpaw and other native only species? What, well, what are your no. thoughts on that? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. If you're talking true native fruit trees, it depends on what you want to eat. If you want to only eat pawpaws and or only eat persimmon, or only eat certain varieties of mulberry. Those are, there's not many native fruits in America. Uh, there's some that you would think would be native fruits. Uh, there, there are some plums. Uh, one is called the ground plum. It is, it's actually in the legume family and it gets about two feet tall. And that, but it is in the plum family. And I don't understand how it can be a legume in the plum family. There's another one called the pigeon plum, uh, but that's supposed to be a native uh, 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 tree. Hawthorn, that is a native. And the fruit is, uh, is small and red and is a lot like a crab apple. And if you wanna have a diet of pulp or a hawthorns, great. But, but there's just not many fruits other than persimmon, uh, pawpaw, and mulberry that most of us would consider a fruit. And, and persimmon is a whole nother story too. Uh, if you've, uh, these are not Asian persimmon. These are North American persimmon. Uh, number one, they're, they're, the trees are typically 50 feet tall, so it's hard to get them. And, uh, and you only eat persimmon after they have gotten very soft. So it's late, late in the season. Otherwise, they're sort of like the, that goji berry, which is very, very astringent. So, so you, you are, some people consider crab apples to be a native, although not all the places will claim that those are, are uh, native to North America. Uh, but again, biting into a, a crab apple probably doesn't give you the satisfaction most people are looking for when they're eating fruit. So it's, it's a case if you want to truly be native only, your choices are very limited and it's not what most of us would consider uh, fruit that we want to go and eat. Uh, would it be great if, if everywhere there were uh, pawpaws? No, that wouldn't be great. Where's the diversity there? So I'm, uh, I, I understand the intent on the question in a perfect world to be great if we had all these type that were native here that had grown uh, uh, here over the, the centuries. But unfortunately that's just not the case. And this is probably a case where we're having imported different fruit varieties 
is uh, is thank goodness. If not, we would have none of the uh, none of the fruits that most of us typically are going to be eating. But by all means, do your part, and I'm doing my part by growing pawpaws, and I also have mulberries. Uh, uh, I I, I want to have a persimmon, but I haven't uh, found a good source yet uh, for persimmon. But I, I think it's uh, it would be very difficult for us to enjoy fruit, if tree fruit, if uh, if we we're just solely depending on native uh, American fruit. So that's yeah. that's my answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. So as as with all things, balance, right? Especially in yes. nature. Wonderful, yeah. Bill. Thank you so so very much for joining us all the way from Ireland while you're out on your. Oh, you know, finally getting some time away from Columbus. <laughs> I'm sure we've all sort of been stuck in our hometowns for quite a while. So thank you very much. And everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. It's wonderful to be able to do this. Um, and especially those of you who are coming from Canada and Wyoming, thank you for joining us. Um, please do come back. Um, you can go to go.osu.edu slash shrubs and sign up for next month's and we'll hopefully see you there and out in the gardens soon so thank you megan for coming she made it back on lost internet connection <laughs> which is what we're up against every month so thank you megan again thank you julia thank you bill thank you bill and grow fruit <laughs> grow fruit yes <laughs> have a good night everybody Good night. Bye.